First presentation is going to be done uh, by Mike Stenko. Uh, looks like he worked with Gerald at New Jersey DOT and it's sealing New Jersey DOT bridge abutments with high molecular weight. Yeah, whatever you say that word, and it's a word I can't say. So, Mike, I'll leave it up to you. It's methacrylate, by the way. Good morning, everybody. So we're going to get into detail, well, not too much detail, but we're going to get into sealing some of our bridge abutments with high molecular weight methacrylates, um, courtesy of Transpo. So we've experienced an increasing number of bridge abutments exhibiting signs of extensive cracking. We've got a couple pictures here. These are what some of our abutments look like. Um, they're down in South Jersey. They've got extensive cracking on them, but the odd thing is all that concrete, as bad as it looks, is completely sound. So when you get out there with your hammer, you go across the whole, the whole abutment, everything is sound. Um, some more pictures. It's really extensive. It goes from the bottom of the abutment all the way up to the top near the bearings. Even the wing walls were getting it too. That was another structure. Um, and just for, uh, for reference, a lot of these were in South Jersey. So if you draw a line from Camden to Atlantic City, I don't know, do we have a laser pointer? So Camden's there, Atlantic City's there, and the weird thing is all of these are south in this area. So north of, it's US 30. North of US 30, we don't have a huge problem. South of US 30, we have a huge problem. Um, and we have two freeways. There's Interstate 295 and New Jersey Route 55, and they both run roughly 40 miles south of Route 30. And it's bridge after bridge after bridge has that same condition. Um, so what we did actually at one of these conferences, we showed the pictures and reached out to Transpo, who had the high molecular weight methacrylate. Um, and they helped us out with a solution. So Mike has some of the details. <clears throat> OK. Uh, what we were looking at is a way of sealing these cracks. And uh, the materials that we were going to use or we proposed to use was a high molecular weight methacrylate or for people that can't pronounce methacrylate, HMWM. In, in the West, they call it humwum. Uh, and we were going to try two application methods. We were going to try low pressure injection, which is a standard material. And then we were going to try hand roller applied uh, to just cover the entire area. And because the cracking was so extensive, we thought that that might be a viable solution. Uh, HMWM has been around probably for 25 years. It was originally developed as a gravity feed uh, surface sealer, and it has the ability to seal cracks down as low as 0.1 millimeters and a very low viscosity. It's got a viscosity just a little bit higher than water, so it, it enables it to penetrate deep into cracks on horizontal surfaces. Uh, the problem that we had here is Gerald wanted to do a vertical surface. And it, you can't really, with the standard material, you can't do a vertical surface. It's just going to run right off the surface, and you'd have a huge puddle down at the, at the roadside. Uh, so what our challenge was, we wanted to maintain the material on the vertical surface and get it to penetrate the pores in the cracks, seal those cracks off so we could prevent further deterioration of those abutments. So what we did is we came up with a new formulation. We went from a material that had 25 centipoise viscosity close to water to a material that had 1,500 centipoise. So initially, what you would think is, by that increase in viscosity, we're going to be putting something on the wall that looks like putty. Uh, but there are chemicals in here that re reduce the surface tension. And what that is is, uh, there's two ways to describe it. It's kind of like ketchup. Ketchup, if you use a knife to spread it, it spreads real, real easy. And the minute you let it alone, it, it kind of hardens back up again. The other thing is, the chemical that l lowers the surface tension is the same chemical or a similar chemical that you use in a dishwasher so you don't get spots on your, on your uh, glasses and things like that after you run them through a dishwasher. It makes, it makes the water run right off of them. It reduces the surface tension. Uh, so with this new material, uh, you apply it with rollers. But there's enough force just with the rollers, just putting it on with the rollers to push it into the pores and the cracks on the concrete. 
So we had two, two locations that uh, were included in our current bridge preventive maintenance contract. Uh, the contractor approached me and really wasn't sure what to do with them. I wasn't really sure what to do with them. Uh, so we reached out to Transpo. Transpo went through our new products and materials division and used these two locations as a test site. So they were gracious enough to donate the material for us. And we had a willing and able contractor who was excellent on the job. And uh, they worked with Transpo to install the material. So the two bridges were US 130 over 295 and Oak Grove Road over 295. And they're both roughly 50 years old with no previous treatments on the abutments. So what you saw in those pictures was when they were built, they were left alone, and that was it. So we had extensive surface cracking when we got, when we got out there. They were up to three inches in depth, but no delaminations. And like I said, no previous treatments or repairs. So our goal was to make sure that those abutments remained sound. Um, we wanted to reduce the potential for spalling due to moisture and freeze-thaw effects. And we wanted to increase the time until abutment rehabilitation is required. Um, we should note that 295 was reconstructed about 10 years ago through there, but they only did the main line. Nobody ever touched the bridges. So they went right under them and left everything alone on these bridges. Okay, so like I said, we, uh, we tried two methods of application. Uh, what we're looking at right here is a, a standard procedure for doing injection. Uh, the nice thing about the, uh, the standard HMWM material is because it has such low viscosity, it doesn't require any special pumps or anything like that to inject it. Uh, what we did is we, we installed ports on the cracks. We tried to identify an area where we had larger cracks and not, not all interconnecting. Uh, we installed the ports, uh, buttered up the crack so that we can keep the material inside the crack, and then you'll see even, even with the process of sealing the cracks with an epoxy, epoxy uh, mortar or uh, paste, uh, we still got bleeding out because what it was doing, it was actually flowing into the crack, but it was following the pores in the concrete and coming out of the concrete below or around the area that we sealed with the epoxy. And you can see here in these photographs, this is the tool that we used. It's a standard two-component caulking gun with just hand pressure. We ran it through a static mixer and through a, a, uh, a port uh, connected to the, uh, to the injection ports. And you just injected until you saw material coming out of the next, the next port. It's a standard uh, method of injection. It's just we're using a much lower, a much lower viscosity material to do the injection. On the roller application, because it has a higher viscosity, uh, we were putting it on with paint rollers. And what we found out is when you had a wider crack, you could actually take the material, again, back to my ketchup reference, you could take the material with a, a putty knife and you could force it into the wider, deeper cracks. Uh, and that, that seemed to work very well. And you can see once they forced it into the cracks, then they came back with a roller and rolled it over again, and you really didn't see any uh, inconsistencies in the surface of the application. Uh, here's, here's the application on one of the structures after we were all done. It does, it permanently darkens the surface of the concrete because that's the color of the, of the material itself. Uh, but I think the application went very quick. And uh, these are some of the cores that, we t that uh, Gerald had the contractor take after the fact. And it, it's a little bit hard to see here, but uh, this is the crack right here. And what we, what we plan to do is after, uh, after this meeting, we're going to have this, the, crack, the cores cut in half. We're going to have them polished. And we'll do some photographs up close of the, of the cracks to see what the, the, the penetration was, as well as how much of the crack did we fill. Um, these were cores taken after the injection. This really surprised us. This was uh, cores taken after the roller application. Uh, again, you'll see right here, this material actually went down the crack, came along the side of the crack on the top of a piece of stone. This is the same core, both sides. Came across the top of this piece of aggregate here, and then it continued to proceed down the other side of the aggregate. Uh, as a company that developed this, we were more than pleased. We were actually shocked when we looked at this. Uh, and you can see there, here's another one. Uh, you know, this is a two-inch core. Uh, you got an inch and three-quarter penetration. The problem was the cores, 
the cores were breaking as they were taking them out. So we really couldn't get the full depth of the penetration. We didn't know what it was. Um, but we were very surprised and pleased by this. Joe, you want to? Yeah, these are just after application photos. Um, you can see our nice date stamp, 1966. That held up well. Um, but um, we should note, too, that the, the application was done in late May, roughly around Memorial Day, and the cores were taken in August. So roughly three months of, uh, of being on the wall before we cored them. So that's what you saw in the, um, in the photos. They weren't taken immediately after. It was a three-month time. Um, so this is what we did afterwards. Initially, it was just going to be one test panel on the bridge, but I like the way it looks so much, and it seemed to be working that we coded the entire abutment on both structures. Um, for the injection, preparation was difficult for, due to the extensive uh, crack patterns that existed. We really didn't want to start crack sealing an entire wall. We would have been out there for months doing something like that. Um, but once we got into it, the process was easy for some of the wider cracks using only hand tools. And uh, it had excellent penetration, um, but the process is more applicable to structures with individual cracks more than um, the extensive map cracking that we saw. So the vertical hand application was what we liked for these structures. No surface prep was required other than to remove any loose concrete or material. Uh, the pa contractor power washed everything off, and then once it dried, we were able to put it right on. Uh, simple mixing in a bucket, and then we rolled it on with just rollers from Home Depot, nothing really uh, too fancy. Uh, larger cracks, the contractor was able to work the material in with a putty knife. Um, we did see a little bit of absorption on some of these structures because they've been out there for 50 years. Concrete was dry. It was starting to um, take in some of the material, so we had to put on a second coat. Um, but a large area was able to be treated in minimal time, so I think we got an entire abutment done in one day. Um, and there is the same structure, a before and after photo. So driving past at 65 miles an hour, or 95 if you're in Jersey, um, it looks really good. So that's it. Any questions? Did they ever determine why the, right over here, did, did they ever determine why the 30, I guess Route 30 you said was the magic boundary? Like, was it a material issue, an exposure issue? It, it could have just been construction. It could have been shrinkage cracking. Um, the geography really changes. South of 30, it gets into a very sandy environment. Um, north of 30, it's the Pine Barrens. And then Interstate 195 kind of divides the state again. And then north of that, it turns into like a rocky soil. So it, it could have been a number of things. Looking at the picture, it looks like it has like a sheen, like it would repel water. It, if water is sprayed on there, does it beat up and run down it? Yes, it's, it's, <clears throat> it's a waterproof material. It's, it's, a, it's a polymer, so once it cures, it, the surface is, is virtually waterproof. I'm just wondering, since the problem seems to be widespread, if the DOT did any testing to establish the cause of the cracking, the concern would be, is this ASR? We brought it up to our structural evaluation unit, and uh, they didn't seem to think it was ASR because the concrete is still sound. Um, and we showed them the materials that we were using here, and they seemed to be all for it and uh, willing to go for the test and see how this holds up. But they really didn't offer much of a solution either. Nobody really knew what to do. And like I said, when 295 was reconstructed a couple years ago, they just went right through here and didn't touch these. There, there appeared to be some surface scaling in one of the pictures of the before pictures. Uh, w did you do any concrete repairs before you applied this? Yes, there was. Um, I know there's a picture. You can see on this, uh, on the left, above the date stamp, you could see there was some hollow concrete on one of the structures. So above that, uh, the date stamp, there was uh, concrete repair required. So anything that was loose or hollow, we did repair with the normal get under the rebar, chip it out, and then uh, pour, pour and pour. We use rapid set for this, um, so 24 hours. Would um, would you consider doing a trial? Oh. Would you consider doing a trial using silene, or would that be applicable in, in this for an application like this? Would there be a cost difference also? I would know that. I, I think uh, silane might might be uh, applicable here. Uh, one thing with this material, I would say that they probably used two gallons, maybe. Yeah. 
about two gallons to coat this area. So the cost of the material to actually do this application was somewhere around seventy dollars. Uh, so it's a very, very low cost uh, application. And the other thing, the difference, you know, the difference between silanes, you know, they have they have their place. I said it the other day at one of the meetings that they all have their place, the high molecular weight methacrylates as well as the silanes. But what you're doing here is you're actually filling those cracks. So you're making sure that nothing, you know, in the future, and as far as I'm concerned, if there's no moisture coming from the backside of this abutment, uh, this crack is sealed for the life of that, of that abutment. Uh, so you've, you've filled the crack, you've sealed it, and the other thing about these materials is the tensile bond strength of the material to the concrete itself is greater than, greater than the tensile strength of the concrete. So if it's going to crack, it's going to crack someplace else. If the cracks continue or they progress, they're going to crack someplace other than where they were cracked originally. So would you actually be looking at this possibly as a rather waiting, doing it prior to the cracking to occur as a preventative method? Instead of using a silane, say, on a, on a barrier that may be subjected to a lot of undesirable there, chemicals? There are states in the Northeast that are using, that do put this on barriers, uh, bridge, bridge uh, barriers and things like that to, to keep the moisture out right from the start. Uh, it will it will seal the surface and prevent you know salt and water from getting in there and causing corrosion. Now, Mike, you mentioned that it's like two gallons and it's seventy dollars for material. Roughly, cost per square foot would be pennies. I mean, yeah, th these bridges they're they're your standard. Uh, it's they're just your standard two span um, and they're maybe one lane and a shoulder each way, so maybe fifty feet wide. So you're and not talking 15 feet tall, so it yeah. Goes a, a gallon goes a long way. Yes. A gallon, a gallon will cover approximately, depending on the surface texture, a gallon should cover somewhere between uh, 150 and 300 square feet. Okay. The other thing is, now, notice you rolled it. If you were doing it where you didn't have any, any cracking at all, could this be spray applied? Sure. Uh, obviously, the material is great for water repellent. Have you guys done any testing, or what would your recommendations be when it comes to graffiti? afterward <laughs> uh, with with most polymers uh, one thing that we found that's uh, kind of a, a detriment to this is we a couple of years ago uh, about 10 years ago we actually treated uh, the corporate parking garage for BMW and it was it did a great job it sealed it because they had actually moisture leaking through the decks onto the cars below and when it when it went through the concrete, it was actually staining, permanently staining the paint on the cars. So we sealed the deck, and then they came back in to replace the line striping uh, in the parking lot, and they found out that nothing would stick to it. So what we ended up having to do is formulate a material based out of the same chemistry so that they could replace the line striping. So I, you know, I can't exactly answer your question, but all I know is it's a devil to put standard line striping, whether it be epoxy, waterborne, or whatever, on top of this material. So I think it would be resistant to uh, graffiti, but that remains to be seen. You can tell you're from the Northeast. I think Seth just solves our graffiti <laughs> problem in New Jersey. <laughs> that's, all, that's all the time we have for questions. Thank you, schedule. All right, thank you.